Now on BBC Radio 4, the writer Laura Barton pieces together the true story of Abna J, a most unusual musical talent. If you happen to stop at the Kmart store in Gainesville, Florida, sometime in the mid-1980s, there's a chance you might have come across Abna J, a strange and quite singular musician. On the back end of that parking lot there, he was set up. And folks would come out of the store and go over and uh, listen to his music and give him a donation. And he could stop anywhere along the country road and play for an hour or two and get him some gig money and then he'd move on. Abner Jay was a one-man band, a songster, a storehouse of yarns and one-liners, a thread that ran back to a different era. To me, it's quintessential Americana. It's very hard for me to explain but personally, I would just say it's, it's an old minstrel southern style type of music. Spiritual. That Florida parking lot was just one of the places that Abner J performed in the mid-80s. He was in his 60s by then, but still an itinerant musician. You might also have caught him at the local flea market in Daytona, at Tom Flynn's Plantation Restaurant in Stone Mountain, Georgia, at the Lakewood Antiques Market, and any number of festivals around the southern states. He'd play songs, crack off colour jokes and try to educate the audience, homilising, sermonising, a kind of secular evangelist. And then he'd pass the hat. He was one of a kind. And this is a story about him. The true story of Abner J. Well, who, who says that I'm going to tell you the truth? <laughs> or who says that I even know the truth? I will uh, tell you some things that I believe to be the truth, and the others I'll, I'll, I don't know. I just know what was true for me with Abner. The true story, well, you would really need to help me out with that. Where would you want to start? For me, it began with the bones. I was sitting in a bar in Tennessee when the stranger next to me began to talk of how people used to play them as a musical instrument. Abner Jay, he said, played the cow bones. And Abner, he told me, was a one-man band, a traveling musician, a bluesman. Though I later came to see how inadequate these descriptions were. I wrote the name down, and the next day I headed to a record store to see if I could find any music by Abner Jay. There's something fevered to the way he sings and plays, something lost and forlorn and ramshackle. He tells of hard times, of death and divorce, cocaine and depression. And amid the music and the anecdotes, the jokes and jovial asides, there lies a kind of desperation. It is a jumbled southernness, eras, styles, locations. This is not a musician who belongs to any one genre, scene or style. He slips from blues to soul to gospel and folk. And just when he looks to be getting comfortable, he moves again. He does not fit, and he will not be found. When we started thinking about putting this radio programme together, sifting through the facts and the fiction, my producer asked me to recap what I thought I knew about Abner J. Like most of us, I know surprisingly little. I know the bare bones of his story. So, you know, he was born in Georgia, started playing a medicine show when he was, I think, five years old. For a, a stretch, he was um, the leader of a minstrel show on the radio. He, I know he was a contemporary or, or a friend of everyone from Little Richard to Elvis Presley. I, I know that he managed nightclubs and he held down quite respectable jobs, but he also put on these astonishing performances and, and had this mobile home that he converted into a stage show and would, would tour throughout the South. Yeah, That was before I'd spoken to those who knew Abner J and those who love his music. I know now that at least some of those things were true, and I think that's the way he would have wanted it, muddied like that. Abner J is somebody who plays with truth and fiction, in his music and beyond. But we can't help wondering. As soon as I heard his music, I was just stunned. That's William Ferris, an expert on the music and culture of the American South. He's convinced that we can bring Abner Jay into focus if we squint at the 19th century travelling minstrel shows that were a feature of Southern life. 
they were a way of bringing entertainment and also selling patent medicine and products. They would come into a community, set up a stage, and perform in ways that go to the heart of what America is all about. The minstrel show was Abner Jay's introduction to performing. He himself said that he joined the Silas Green from New Orleans traveling show at the age of 11. But I'm not sure that I entirely trust Abner Jay's version of his own life. Many of the great early voices of blues and country music like Bessie Smith, Ma Rainey, Jimmy Rogers started as aspiring musicians who left their homes to join a minstrel show. And that's exactly what Abner Jay did. Terrible things are always making headlines. Every time you turn your television on the news, you see something that happened that is terrible. Maybe you all never seen me on television. It's possible because I've never been on television. You got to be terrible to get on television. Is that largely because of the humor as well? Because that's one of the things that most struck me when I first heard him. Yes. I think you feel in that kind of spontaneity his engaging the audience as he would on the stage of a minstrel show. And it creates a kind of spontaneity because if the audience laughs, then you go further with that line. And that is exactly what he does. He's throwing out lines, he's singing, he's doing a kind of multi-rhythmic sound that blends both the spoken word and music in the same performance. What do you give an elephant with diarrhea? Plenty of room. Give me another damn drink. But it's hard to trust what we think we know about Abner Jay because he fed us so many half-truths. In handwritten and misspelt notes attached to his roughly made records and tapes, as well as in leaflets handed out at shows, he would spin tall stories about himself, that he had had seven wives and 16 children, that his banjo was 200 years old, that he drank a gallon of river water every day and that he'd been a pimp for many years. Here's one of those leaflets written in the third person. Abner was hired out to white plantation owners when he was at the age of six. Abner worked as a slave side by side with his grandpa, a former slave. Abner could not and did not receive his pay until after he was 21 years of age. Abner ate and slept in the barn with the mules. Folk often walk up to Abner and ask if they can touch him to see if he is really real. It's hard to know what to believe. I don't want to dispel too many myths because I think they're still fun, you know. And he'll tell you a lot of funny things, and if you're not really paying attention, they'll just seem silly, but there is some truth to a lot of what he said. This is Jay Martin, an archivist, DJ, and fan, who's done his own digging into the truth of Abner Jay. Hold on, here we go. Abner Jay, the first of the original black musicians, the only electric six-string banjo you'll ever hear. Abner says the original, originals are dead, and he is half dead. <laughs> born in South Georgia. When Abner was born, his pa kept the birth records on the side of a house. The house burned down. The birth records were destroyed, and Abner hasn't been able to find out just how old he is. Abner is now enjoying his seventh wife, and he claims she is just about wore out too. His worst tragedy was the first time he got married. Now it's buck dancing time. The reason young people you so, as you can see, he talks about how his birth records were kept on the side of a house and that the house burned down. He doesn't really know how old he is. But in reality, we do. He did have a birth certificate issued after the fact. I believe in 1942, his mother and father requested a new birth certificate and had it certified based on records kept in a family Bible. And that his birthday was ultimately, I believe, July 21st, 1921. So does that dispel any myths? <laughs> Yeah, 
Years after they were made and mostly forgotten, the internet has allowed Abner Jay's songs to find a new audience. Select, admittedly, but hungry for these rough-edged recordings. But has this new audience found him? And what else do they uncover? Certainly a spirit that we don't encounter every day, but perhaps also a kind of authenticity that seems strangely to be certified by the deliberate slipperiness of Abner's truth. Jay Martin has been instrumental in giving Abner Jay this second life. Through an ongoing series of compilations and re-releases, he's organised for the vinyl-only Mississippi Records label, based in Portland, Oregon. One of the hardest records of his to find, the original pressing of Folk Song Stylist, was recorded in 1964, and three or four years ago, I found a copy of it on eBay. The seller found a copy of the record for like 50 cents. Didn't really know what it was, but thought it looked cool, and, and apparently did some research on the internet himself and realized what he had. And, I ended up giving him a lot of money for it because it was uh, probably the last thing of Abner's that, that I found. Am I allowed to know what his records go for now on the market? That record in particular is a $500 record. Um, it really just depends, you know, mm -hmm. depends on the nature of the market at the time. Depends on if I don't have it and I'm willing to pay that much, which I would. <laughs> I can't help wondering what Abner J would have made of an exchange like that. It's difficult to follow exactly how many recordings he made over the years. Early on, they're for scattered and now forgotten record labels. Later, homespun and self-released on a label that he named after possibly the best person to turn to in search of the truth about Abner J, his daughter, Brandy. Were you aware growing up that he was very different to other people's fathers? Oh, yes, yes. My father was a grand personality, um, nothing shy about him, very brutally honest, but loved life. He was very uh, unique. Were you proud of his difference growing up? Yes, I was. He was just fun. Uh, liked to live pretty much like he did growing up, being able to grow their own food and having um, the animals. And, you know, he actually built a barn for the horses that we had and he actually built the structure that we lived in. Did he explain to you specifically what he was trying to do with the music? It was more about the culture of the South, the struggle of growing up minority or black in the South. Even though he loved his South, he loved his Georgia, but at times it was, you know, not an easy place to live. And his music was just kind of a manifest of him going through life and it also served as a source of strength almost I was born during the hot depression days oh my lord in July in South Georgia He was born in 1921, so, you know, imagine the Depression, poor black, sharecropping, picking cotton. Just remember him talking about just how hard it was, food, everything, you know. His father was very mean and disconnected. And at one point, I think right before he did finally leave, his father actually pointed a gun at him, a shotgun at him. I think that was the last time he's seen him for a long, long, long time. So we know a few things about Abner J now, but are we any closer to the true story? Truth has always meant more than just facts. Truth is something that hangs between the verifiable details. It is not so much the gospel as the ghost. And maybe that's where the truth of Abner J might lie. Hold his stories up to the light or bite down hard upon them and you'll find that many are counterfeit. His music, his image, his way of living were carefully and deliberately constructed. And yet, he represents a truth that you don't hear from other people. A truth about a way of life, a history, a people, the role of music and story in a nation's idea of itself. 
He was, in many ways, not just an itinerant musician, but a traveling folk art exhibition. Ultimately, that trailer was his livelihood. I mean, it was his stage, it was his office, it was his record shop. There's a picture that we included in the uh, record that we put out of his very last recordings of him standing in front of that trailer. And you can see the little sign that's posted on the front, buy my cassettes, you know, all money goes to me. It was really where he, I won't say lived, because he did have a trailer in Georgia that he would go back to, but that trailer was ultimately his life. And it was on this mobile stage, performing at a flea market in Daytona, Florida, that Sherry Sherrod Dupree first encountered her friend, Abner Jay. He was playing several instruments at one time. I think that's what caught my uh, attention. Blowing the harmonica, and he was beating the drum uh, with his legs and playing the famous banjo, yes. It caught my eye, and we stopped. American music dates back to 1620, and the first form of American music is rattled, deboned. And another thing that I was just carried away with, um, he took a few minutes and he did a few clickings with his cow bones. And that was that definitely had my attention because I had seen very few people play cow bones. You see, when a cow gets struck by lightning, you don't eat that cow unless you eat at McDonald's. You take that cow way back over yon in them their woods, and the possum eat the meat and we eat the possum. Now, ain't nothing no better for you than baked possum with them baked taters all around him, see. And this here song dates back to 1620. Rattle, D-Bone. He was just thrilling and how he had his fingers moving and the clicking of the bones. And then he started doing a little dance and it was just wonderful. And then uh, after a while he got down and he did the ham bone. My sons just had a fit to see him doing the ham bone and moving his legs and my guys wanted to try it too. So they just had a good time. And if you ain't never seen this black dude beat the ham bone, you still ain't never seen it done right. Cause I'm the only black dude done it right. Ham bone, ham bone, ham in the hole there. As he danced, he would take his hands and hit his thighs. And as he hit the thighs, it gave different sounds. And he would be singing and dancing all at the same time. And it's known as ham bone. And it's very popular among African-American men. The ham bone is a mesmerizing dance to behold. The body itself a percussive instrument. Thighs slapped, cheeks popped as if the rhythm has run down deep and irresistibly into the bones of the performer. The cow bones and the ham bone were minstrel staples, forerunners of tap dancing, some people say, a legacy of slavery, when no other instruments were available. And what Abner Jay is doing here is dancing a fine line, a balancing act, taking these deep traditions and using them cleverly to travel through a different society and a different time and make a workable career full of contradictions and based on an identity that neither he or we are ever really certain of. We have evidence, don't we, that he was quite successful in other ways. As a nightclub manager and managed sister Rosetta Tharp, I think. Um, yes. And yet he brings this sort of real ramshackle persona to the stage, doesn't he? That's right. And, and see, that's a contrived persona. He is a very sophisticated, educated person. He has great skill as a performer, and he chooses to present himself as a menstrual figure. But he also sees that there's a wealthy, anxious white audience ready to hear that performance, and they expect it, and he gives it to them with vigor. I remember when we were in Atlanta, he wanted to have that um, Uncle Ben look. He wanted to have that white, cotton-looking hair. So I remember him trying to dye it or put peroxide on it because he wanted that persona because it, it fits his music. 
And so any of the tales that he would say or any of the exaggerations, it was all to promote and to give you a feeling outside of the instrument of his music. And if he could have got that hair white, he would have had it that way. W.E.B. Du Bois talks about the double consciousness of blacks in America. They have to be conscious of white worlds and black worlds, and that is a given, whether we're talking about Abner J. or Barack Obama. There is a double consciousness that may save your life if you're a young black man, as we've seen your fair game on the streets and back roads in America. And artists like Abner J. bring that consciousness to the stage in their music. The last old Mr. Man. Thank you. Thank you. The array of tapes that he has here at five dollars a shot is perfectly remarkable. And probably this is one of the most vanishing traditions we've ever had on this stage. No break in that. If we really want to piece together the true story of Abner Jay, then we can at least see him in action. There's a shaky film clip of him on the internet older and more frail. So this is Abner Jay um, playing the Grassroots Festival in New York in 1993. And the camera pans out. And you see how ramshackle his mobile home looks. Like a shack, really. Above him there's a, a handwritten sign saying that he's the last minstrel show. There's a note accompanying the video that informs us that this was Abner Jay's last ever performance and that he died on the journey home. But like so much with Abner Jay, that's not quite true. The myth continues. <laughs> no, of course not. Uh, that that might have been the same trip where I had to send, wire him money to get his uh, RV fixed to get him home. So be it, whatever. But no, that the tape you've got the tape of the last performance. And that was the 25th, I believe, of September, 1993. And he's going to be dead within, I think, around six weeks from there. I'm Georgia Brown. Jack Teague is a teacher from Atlanta who was fascinated by Abner Jay's stories. They made an unusual pair. Jack was in his 20s, Abner in his 70s, but they became firm friends in the last year of Abner's life. In the 1990s, in the American South, we were a very odd team. Late at night driving, going to restaurants together. His areas of interest were so off what you would think. He was so well educated and so aware of what was going on. Abner's records and tapes were recorded in a rough and amateurish fashion, and it was Jack's goal to haul his friend into a decent recording studio and get his truth on tape for posterity. Before that, though, he cajoled him into recording a demo tape in Abner's trailer. And his trailer was in the middle of all these fields of collards and there's lightning off in the distance and he turned the lights down low. But so all it was was there's that window, Abner, his silhouette more or less, and every once in a while this white light with the lightning in the background. And the red light of the recorder. And I just let him go and he made it through about six or seven songs. And again, he still uh, kind of let me have it for bringing such a ridiculous little recorder along. And I took him out to my car and I said, check this out. Put the cassette in and he was blown away. But then it wasn't uh, much after that that he started, he started to decline. And we just never got to make it to the studio because everything else started going health wise and rapidly so. The true story of Abner J. There's a lot that I learned that isn't included in this program. Areas I couldn't go into and things that couldn't be squeezed in. Fragments that didn't fit. In the end, we can only tell part of the story. And maybe that's how Abner would have wanted it. Never quite found, not quite fitting in, lying just beyond our reach. We go looking for truth, 
we search for authenticity, but all we ever find is a series of different perspectives, constructions, impressions. Abner was a family man, a friend, a father, a partner, a veteran. He was a sometime janitor, a black man, a southern man, a man who loved horses. He was a musician, of course, a songwriter and performer who was bold and inventive and ahead of his time. He was, as he proclaimed, the last old minstrel man. But he was also, from another perspective, the elderly man playing cowbones in the parking lot of a Florida Kmart. What are you talking about, some way out blues? <laughs> One of the most memorable times we had together was right before he died in the veterans hospital. He was lying in bed and his legs were ashy. His, his skin was dry. And his physical appearance was extremely important. What did I do? Well, you do what you do for a friend. So I got a bottle of lotion and I um, applied lotion to his legs so they weren't ashy. Now a nurse comes in there. I got the most, the most insane looks like, what is he doing with that old man? Why is he doing that? Is he family? What is this? And then there were the times when he'd come home and he wouldn't tell me he had bought a horse. Uh, and then one day he came home and there was this trailer behind him pulling a horse and I just remember coming up the driveway, and I was just, I, know, I was about eight years old, 10 years old, or somewhere around that, and just being so excited about it. You know, he just, he just was an awesome father. When times were good, they were good, you know. If this search for the true story of Abner Jay has shown me anything, it's that there are always more truths to find, more sides to this man, more stories to tell. So many things that stay hidden. And maybe some of the joy lies in the not knowing in the question of him, in the mystery, and the yearning for more. Looking back at my age now, and thinking about all the times that he would talk about his life, and wishing that I had paid more attention, you know, so it's, it's kind of embarrassing that I can't answer some of your questions. I just, just know him as a father, and that he just really loved, loved what he did. This is not a traditional musician. He is creating a persona through that music in ways that I've never heard before. Part of his fascination for me is trying to figure out who is Abner J. The True Story of Abner J was presented by Laura Barton. The producer was Martin Williams. And there are extra clips and photographs of Abner J on the BBC Radio 4 website.